some years back I was sitting with other ministers and we were talking and uh, trying to understand uh, certain situations and this one minister uh, very well known in the church uh, said you got to understand the Genesis and understanding the Genesis in other words the beginnings is always very important and and I, I when he said that I to me it was a profound statement and for many years I kept thinking and meditating about it literally for a long time and the Genesis the beginnings of something of anything could be of a construction project why are you building this building for instance why are you why are you getting married you know what is it reveals something it reveals the motive the intent and the purpose and it's very important for us to understand the Genesis because we then understand what was the motive the intent and purpose of why this thing was created or built or started was the motive the intent and the purpose an honorable one or was based on a mixture of good and evil in other words a fraudulent uh, genesis my purpose today brethren is to talk about the genesis in other words, the purpose, the intent of the creation of man. The creation of mankind. And that intent is re revealed right at the beginning in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, verse 26. So let's turn to Genesis uh, chapter 1 verse 26 and it says then God said let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and then a little later in verse 27 says so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created man so obviously when we use the word man we mean mankind that obviously means man and woman but the intent and purpose, the desire, the ultimate desire of God was to create sons and daughters of God in His image and in His likeness. Now think about it. Think about it. For you to be a son of God, just like your own children and your daughters are like you they I was just watching one of my grandsons you know he's, he's playing with the parents and he's being a little cheeky and he says well this is my bed well it's actually the parents bed you know and things like that so it's so cute but it just shows that there is that bond and then he says, well, well where does, where's mom's bed? Well, it's yeah. And where's that bed? It's yeah. And where's your bed? It's yeah. <laughs> In the middle. You know, it's so cute seeing they, they, they're doing little things like that. But it just shows that closeness that, um, that it is between parents and children. Uh, they have one kind. There's one likeness. There's, and, and therefore, to be of the likeness, as it says... In, in God's image and his likeness we would have to be beings and we would have to be because that's part of the goal beings that can make decisions and you know you and I when we raise up children one of the things we want our children is teach them values that they learn to make good decisions isn't it? I mean that's in the end uh, one of the goals of child rearing 
that your children make right decisions because that's going to affect their whole life you can make one wrong decision sometimes you make wrong decisions and they're minor things but you can make one wrong decision and messes your whole life for your whole life what one wrong decision so you want to kind of teach your children in a way to protect them to make them aware of the danger of making a wrong decision that will affect them completely think about it God wants you and I part of his family having his likeness having us ultimately as spirit beings in his family like he is being able to make sound balanced decisions which are based on the law of love and of what can concern of what the good of all and for men of all beings and he, he wants to give you that power eternal power and eternity to do that so could he do could he teach you that by making you a robot no because you'll never learn the lessons you see it's like for you to learn a bicycle ride a bicycle you have to get on the bicycle and you have to try and maybe fall a bit and get up again and you help and, until you actually ride the bicycle but you have to go through it and 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 learn when you fall to get up again so the intent of God to create mankind it was the genesis the beginning why did he create mankind is so that mankind are going to be children of God in the kingdom of God yeah that's what it says yeah, in, in Genesis 1 26 27 basically but to do that he has to give mankind free moral agency the, uh, the option to make their own choices and to mess it up and to hit the nose or the face against the wall and realize haha that's a wall I better not go that way now God can tell you don't go that way but you know you and I are just kind of stubborn we'll go that way bang and then we realize well it's a wall well God says well I told you <laughs> and then you learn to go the right way and you say okay fine now I'll go the right way but you know we have to learn through what it's called the school of hard knocks isn't it so true don't our children have to go through that it's a fact now for us to be part of the family of God God had to give us that the opportunity of having free moral agency the alternative you're a robot you know you just do what's been programmed to do and that is not what God wants of his children he wants children that will do things the way God do, does but a free way uh, without God having to be on top of them you know it's, it's kind of sometimes uh, we see people in the church for a long time and then they say why doesn't God show me what to do well maybe God He's taking his hands off to see if you're learning to make the decision so that he can give you more power in the world tomorrow. Maybe. You know, as initially when we're children, we have to be told, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But as we are teenagers, we expect, we expect the children to be able to make some decisions. And it's kind of like through that teenage we kind of start loosening the bonds and and allowing them to make some decisions but not too much so that they don't get badly hurt but you know it's part of that growing process 
You know what I'm talking about. You are parents. You know what I'm talking about. So God has to do the same thing with us. Let me ask another question. You as parents, have you ever seen one of your children that has never, never in his life done a thing wrong? <laughs> have you ever seen a child that has never, even though you told him, don't do that, hey, well, sooner or later we'll do something wrong. Fact. They'll do it. Therefore, you as a parent know what? You know that there will be times that you'll have to correct them. And by correct, I mean guide them the right direction to say, this is the way. Walk you in it. Not the other way. Hey, hey, not that way, but this way. That's what I mean by correct. It's not taking a whip and whatever. I mean correct is just point in the right direction says no no not that way this way that's a fact you know that so you know and I know we know as parents that our children will one day sooner or later do something wrong fact therefore God knew from the beginning that sooner or later his children, mankind, will do something wrong. Fact. But that thing wrong would be breaking God's law of love. Fact. He knew that mankind, sooner or later, would break God's law of love. John, uh, Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death right so God knew that sooner or later you would die because you made the wrong decision and therefore God's plan of making you a son of God is expired because you're dead he wants to have children he has to give them free moral agency. He knows that sooner or later they're going to do something wrong. Therefore, they're going to sin. Therefore, the wage of sin is death. Therefore, his plan cannot be executed. Because the children will die. Therefore, before he created a plan, he devised a plan of buying the people back from death by having the word which became Christ his son emptying himself becoming a human being and dying for us so that through his suffering and sacrifice we could be bought back redeemed back to life and that way his plan could succeed the, f the second the suffering understand this this is vital for us to understand the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was and was required as an integral part of the success of that plan before the beginning of the plan and it had been decided before the plan started being executed turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 through 20 first Peter chapter 1 verse 18 through 20 <clears throat> knowing that you are not redeemed brethren we know that we're not bought back from death 
we are not bought back with uh, US dollars uh, printed by the federal <coughs> bank or uh, with cryptocurrency or whatever <laughs> you are not redeemed as it says here in verse 18 with corruptible things corruptible things like silver or gold from our aimless conduct from our behavior then we kept knocking the nose and the head against the wall we are not brought back because that way is the way of death and that way we receive by tradition from our families it's, it's our genetic code it's the way we made but we were bought back with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot he indeed Christ indeed was foreordained in other words it was known before decided before the foundation of the world It was decided before the foundation of the world that he would have to suffer and die for us. But that was only made revealed, made manifest in these lost times. Let's just make sure that we underline this principle that we have to understand. Christ's death was in fact his suffering and death was an integral part and necessity of the plan of God to create sons and daughters of God in his family the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a requirement is an integral part it's a necessity for the success of this plan. Why? <clears throat> so that you and I can learn by our wrong choices. Now when you and I make wrong choices, what do we cause? Sure, the end result is death. But before that, we call suffering. Suffering on us or suffering on others. Like for instance, you drive bad and you cause an accident. Other innocent people suffer. And maybe they suffer for the rest of their lives because of your wrong decision. So Christ's suffering and death is a requirement for this plan to succeed. So that he can pay and redeem us back. But we have to be allowed free moral agency so that we learn from the bitter school of hard knocks not to do it again. Therefore, that is the way that we can be children of God in the family of God. But it's not just there for us that suffer, but Christ had to suffer and die. But now think about this. So many of you have children. And I want to ask you as parents, when your children suffer and when your children die, do you pain over it or no? Do you feel the pain? Do you suffer as well? Probably even more than them. 
as parents you suffer as well you pain for your children you see both the father and the son suffered it was not just a son I mean yes we can say we can understand Christ's suffering you read in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 to 8 you know that he was in the form of God he was equal to God and he emptied himself voluntarily in other words he, he became a human being voluntarily from the kind of being or the form of God to become of the form of man he did that voluntarily and not only did he do but he became obedient and he has two lessons is he humbled himself and obedience big pillars big pillars humility and obedience humility and obedience or put in other ways being humble and being showing righteousness or having integrity a leader a good true leader must be humble and have absolute integrity and Christ showed that he humbled himself from being the form of God to become a human, be a human being and dying on the cross for you and I absolutely humility and he was obedient to death absolute integrity key characteristics of a leader ask speak to any leadership school they'll tell you key important points as a leader you've got to remain humble and you've got to have integrity that's why this world's full of corruption because a lot of our leaders are not humble and they're not have they do not have integrity but getting back to the point Christ suffered yes you and I can understand Christ suffered but what quite often we do not think is that the father also suffered just like you as a parent if you see your child suffering you suffer with them I remember my mom when my dad died and uh, he died of cancer and my mom said to her that was a enormous pain seeing a son dying before her you know a parent usually thinks well I'm going to die first for old age and and the son from the side I know in the case of my brother he didn't want to tell my mom that he was very bad because he didn't want to disappoint her because he thought well because she's old she's probably going to go away first so I don't want to tell her but then the situation he worsened very quickly and then we had to tell her kind of on the last moment on the last few days and that was an even bigger shock so uh, but the point I'm saying is the parents suffer mom and dad suffer when they see the children suffering or dying look with me to Romans chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 verse 8 but God demonstrates that's the father demonstrates his own love towards us the father demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us he sent his beloved son to die for us while we're at sinners that proves the father's love you as a parent let your child die for somebody else that shows love for somebody else <coughs> so let's sub recap what we said so far God's plan and purpose for mankind is for us to be beings with the capability to make decisions in eternity without always having to oh, make sure there will be times but th without always being what do I do this? Do I do this to the left or to the right? Hey, you grown up! 
you grown up make your decisions and that's what it is God wants you and I to grow up and to make decisions as children of God but this learning process involves developing character involves learning to overcome involves having to make sometimes wrong decisions and therefore it required the death of Christ to buy us back and you know that's how God dealt all the way from the beginning you look at Adam and Eve they had a choice two trees and they made the wrong choice they said take this tree the tree of life which basically means God tells you what is right and wrong and you believe and trust God you are faithful you are loyal you know so uh, as we heard in the sermonette loyalty basically loyalty is faithfulness you know you are faithful you are loyal so God tells us what's right and wrong how does he tell us through his law, law of love and he says follow what I'm telling you right and wrong and you will have life and this is the tree of life but then he gave to Adam and Eve the other tree that says you have the free moral agency to yes um, I think that door is you know, open there somebody can just close it for us please uh, you have the free moral agency to um, to decide to believe in me to trust in me or you say I don't trust God and therefore, it, therefore I don't obey God because I don't trust him I don't believe God because I don't trust him you know trust and belief are very similar words but I will decide for myself what is right and wrong I will decide what is right and this is what the society is today well you can decide whether this is right or whether that is wrong it depends on your circumstance or whatever it is and that is the tree of knowledge of good and evil or in other words the tree of death so God gave Adam and Eve a choice trust me or don't trust me trust me I tell you what's right and wrong you don't trust me you decide for yourself what's right and wrong and you're going to hit your head against the wall until you learn that what I'm saying is true and that's the situation with Adam in fact even with his children even look at Cain look at Genesis chapter 4 verse 5 Genesis chapter 4 verse 5 you get a situation there that Cain was unhappy because God did not like the sacrifice of Cain he disobeyed he disobeyed it's this is speculative maybe it was a sacrifice because they were doing the Passover and had to be a sacrifice of an animal because the Passover already remember Christ was slain from the foundation of the world so surely I would not be surprised if that was probably the reason of that sacrifice that had to be an animal and and Cain said well I'll just take sacrifices of vegetables or whatever which is an acceptable sacrifice but not in this instance and so he disobeyed he decided for himself what's right and wrong so his countenance was unhappy oh, God doesn't love me you know smack me or whatever you know it's like children you know when you do wrong and mom and dad gives you a smack you know. that happens then what did God say to him look at verse 7 if you do well 
will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is at the door. And the desire of sin is for you. In other words, your ways being caught, captivated, uh, a slave of that desire of sin, a slave of sin. But you should rule over it. You gotta have self control and overcome and put away sin. That's what he's saying. You have to overcome. That's what God was telling him. Overcome. Brethren, that's the same thing we tell our children. Don't do it. You gotta overcome. And you know, it's the same thing is true for all of us. For all of us. In fact, throughout the church era, you read in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, which is the seven letters to the seven churches, and all of them at the end says, overcome. All of them. Not, there's no exception. All of them says, overcome. We all have to overcome. And brethren, we have to fight this as it, as it, it told Cain you've got to rule over it we've got to have a fighting spirit you see you read at the end of Revelation it says cowards will not be in the kingdom why? because you have to have a fighting spirit look at Matthew 11 verse 12 Matthew 11 verse 12 Matthew 11 verse 12 and from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force brethren you and I have to be violent and and overcome our weak human natures by force we got to be violent against our own carnality. We got to be violent against our own weaknesses and flaws. You cannot say, "Oh well, you know it's me. I just can't overcome." Well, God gives us His, His Spirit, and you have to exercise self-control. God does not give you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 6 and 7 you have to have courage, you have to have force, you have to have power and love towards fellow man it's not violence against your enemies because it says love your enemies it's violence against your own self, against your own human nature, against your own flaws that's what we're going to fight and we're going to have a sound mind. We're going to think clearly. Brethren, this world today, you hear what people say, there's no sound mindness. There's no common sense. Common sense is gone out. I'm disgusted when I hear some of the news, in particular political comments. There's no common sense. These people have gone bonkers. You and I do not have a spirit of fear because we gotta be violent against ourselves, against our own natures, not against other people, but against ourselves, and we're gonna take the kingdom by force. In other words, you and I have to do our part. We have to be soldiers of Christ with ourselves, with our carnal mind. Look at Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 and 13 for we do not wrestle against other people you see our fight is not against other people we're fighting wrong vibes wrong feelings wrong things we have a spiritual warfare against ourselves and against spiritual beings Therefore, verse 13, 
take up the whole armor of God and stand as a fighter and fight with the truth and with righteousness doing what's right and having the hope of the gospel of peace because that keeps you anchored and have absolute trust and faith in God that he will help you and keep thinking about the salvation of what God is giving us and use God's Holy Spirit which is a spirit of power of love and a sound mind you see Cain had this test Cain had to overcome but he did not overcome it he did not overcome it he killed his brother he took him aside and killed his brother he was overrun by his own selfishness and carnality and that led to murder Do you know what that means? It means that he did not believe or trust what God said. God said to him, you got to overcome it. you got to fight that desire. And what he did? He did not trust God. He did not have faith in what God said to him. Ah, oh, no, that's, I'll just do what I feel and so it has been the story of mankind in other words not trusting God or in other words not having the courage to do what we are told and supposed to do And that's been the history of mankind. Okay, a few notable exceptions, for instance, Noah and others. A few notable exceptions. But otherwise, mankind has always gone down this road of not trusting and not believing what God said. And then, getting back to the Genesis, we get to a man that trusted God you know, it was that obeyed God when God said do he did it because he trusted God he believed in God you see belief means trust whenever you read the word believe read trust in other words read obey whenever you read the word believe read obey See, if you believe me, you're going to do what I tell you, and therefore you're going to, by doing what I'm telling you, that means you obey. Believe means obey. If you don't believe, if I tell you, don't cross the street, there's a car coming, oh, I don't believe, I'll cross the street, bang, and you eat my car. Well, you didn't believe, because you didn't obey. That's what it is. When we believe God, we obey God. We trust what He says. But then we get to the story of a man. Abraham a man that not only he trusted God he believed God but he taught he commanded his family and his children to obey yeah is we have a man that not only he believed yeah there were others that believed and obeyed like Noah but we don't have a good story of the children etc of Noah but we have a story of Abraham in a sense was the first family because you hear the father of the faithful Abraham, Isaac and Jacob it ran down that family tree and yeah, it's a big lesson for us are we practicing something and encouraging and coaching our children and grandchildren to go the same way doesn't mean that we'll always succeed because once they grow up they're going to do their own thing but are we doing like Abraham did and we read in Genesis chapter 12 that he's told leave the, the land where you live 
Genesis chapter 12. And then he says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house. It was, don't be influenced by this world around you. And build up a family which is a godly family. And then I'll make you, verse 2, a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. In other words, God was seeing that Abram had the potential to not only obey, but to teach his children to obey. Sure, there were a lot of faults. You all can see. We all do faults. Right? So, yeah, we all do faults. It's not snow white or whatever. You know, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there is that that linkage of obedience going from Abram, Isaac and Jacob so he says and because of that because of your family he saw the potential of that and therefore I'll bless your family it will become a great nation a great, great blessing of your genealogy which usually in the church is used to call the word race but it I'm not talking about races in race, but in genealogy, as you, because there were various nations that came out of it. But also it says at the end of verse 2, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There was not only a blessing for his genealogy and children and grandchildren and children beyond, but also to the whole of mankind. It was a promise of grace all families of the earth will be blessed and we read in Genesis 12 later on and in Genesis 17 uh, that his name was changed to Abraham instead of Abram meaning the father of many nations and you can read through that story but one point I brief I want to highlight here is, is Genesis 18 Genesis 18 verse uh, verse 10 starting from uh, verse 10 and it says I'll certainly return to you according to the time of life Sarah your wife shall have a son so Yah is promising him to have a child when they were already at an age where she could not bear children so there is a promise and he believed and he believed and then it says in verse 19 you see, this is a very interesting statement that sometimes we don't notice. And it says, God is saying, I know Abraham, I know him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. God had the inkling, let's call it that. He could see the character, you know. And quite often, you can see people says, "Yeah, he's got that. He's got that potential," you know. And God could see, with His greater wisdom, could see he had the potential that He was going to teach His children that He would have an obedient family. That is important. That's why we have the genesis, yeah, of a family from which all the promises follow because there's a family here. and how many people have you seen there's families in the church who are kind of spread out and, and are blessed and different things through those families that is such a blessing and then we see Isaac being born Isaac w uh, was um, a child of promise you know, he was 100 years old. His wife, I think, was about 90 years old, if I remember correctly. So, she was beyond childbearing. And uh, and then we read um, in Genesis chapter 22, where God says, Go and sacrifice your son. Go and sacrifice your son. And And as you read through it, you see that Isaac was not three years old or five years old he was probably in his early twenties um, or late teens or early twenties 
and therefore was a strong young man and you know what Abraham did he trusted God he did what God told him to do and look at verse 8 and verse 9 of Genesis 22 Genesis 22 verse 8 and 9 and Abraham said because Isaac said dad where, where, where's, the sac where's the offering where's the, the sheep or, he says, or the lamb or the goat and he said my son verse 8 God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering and so the two went together now they go up now there's a place where he's going to sacrifice him he gets everything right, ready there and he says and they built an altar you see that in verse 9 and then he placed the wood in order and then Isaac said Isaac lie down what that me yes you Isaac lie down and he binds Isaac now if you were a 20 year old young man what are you going to do he says no dad you're nuts <laughs> no dad but you see God had promised to Abraham that through Isaac there will be descendants and God gave him Isaac so he had this knowledge or surety or promise from God that God does not lie that he's faithful that he's loyal and so he trusted in God that's why I said God will provide absolute trust you see Isaac was a son of promise was a gift he's the only child born that way of him through a promise uh, Ishmael was not born through a promise but he was born through a promise and and then he bound him and then you read that in verse uh, 11 so in verse 10 he was ready to actually kill him he was kind of with the hand or going down with the knife to kill him and the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said Abraham Abraham so he said yes God here I am and he said do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him for I now I know now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son your only son of a promise the only son this way of this kind from me you've not withheld it imagine the challenge mental challenge that Abraham was going through in his mind having to kill his son I mean imagine it. What, how would you react Imagine the anguish in the sun when you're seeing what his dad was going to do. It's both. And so Abraham proved his love. And therefore now the promise becomes unconditional. You can see, therefore now this will happen. You read that in verse 15 through 18. This will happen. But look at Yah. Abraham gave his son Isaac which he received by faith was prepared to do that he received by faith from God but God also gave Abraham because of his faith the sacrifice you see faith works faith without works is dead you read that in James chapter 2 verse 20 faith without works is dead and you read the story there in James clearly shows that Abraham and Isaac, uh, and Isaac yeah we can see an interesting point of type and antitype think about that Abraham and Isaac is a type of the love the Father and Jesus Christ have for us a type 
and an antitype. Abraham and Isaac here is a type pointing to exactly what God is doing with his son, or has done with his son. And therefore, it shows love and sacrifice. And we read in Romans 5 verse 8, it says, This therefore proves the Father's love towards us. And the interesting thing, even the Father has works. Think about it. They had to do it. They had works. The Son had works. They had to do it. They had to go through it. To pay for our sins. You know John 3.16. Your only begotten Son so loves God the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This therefore makes it even clearer how God loves us. God wants you and I in His family as His children. Look at John, First John, First John, chapter four, First John, chapter four. Verse 9 and 10. In this is the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent His only begotten Son. The only Son monogenous that was begotten that way. Just like Isaac was the only Son begotten that way. Into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God. But that he loved us. And sent us his son. To be the atonement. The propitiation. For our sins. He's the atonement for our sins. He's the propitiation. The word propitiation basically means atonement. To make us at one with him. Brethren, this is the genesis of physical Israel and spiritual Israel through a family which is Abram, Isaac and Jacob. Physical Israel was supposed to be a blessing to all nations. Look at uh, Genesis 35 verse 1 and 2. Genesis 35 verse 1 and 2 so another little scripture there that backs up the one I mentioned just now in uh, Genesis 18 verse 19 but look at Genesis 35 verse 1 and 2 Genesis 35 verse 1 and 2 Then God said to Jacob, Abram, Isaac, Jacob. You see that family line? Jacob, arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods, that are among you purify yourselves and change your garments can you see that same attitude of commanding his household to follow and do what God wants them to do it's a family example all the way from Abraham and therefore we see that Jacob now becomes Israel He's changed his name to Israel. And then we know the story in Genesis 48 where uh, Israel, which is Jacob, blesses his children or grandchildren. And in case of Ephraim and Manasseh, he takes Ephraim, which was the youngest, and says he's going to be a multitude of nations with his right hand. And Manasseh, the older 
to be a great nation with his left hand and we have a booklet that explains in great detail how the blessings physical blessings of Israel have been passed down and that's the reason why this nation is so blessed today great physical blessings and through Israel many other nations are being blessed physically speaking and this shows how the United States of America for instance is, has been blessed it shows God's faithfulness to that original promise to Abraham but but the nation of Israel the greater Israel Ephraim and Manasseh the Israelite people the English speaking people the United States and England and other English speaking nations we have disobeyed God and we are disobeying God and you read Deuteronomy 28 says you do what I says and there will be blessings from verse 1 through 14 there will be blessings and then from verse 15 to the end of the chapter but if you don't obey me you will be cursed in the city in the land and things like that brethren brethren the time of punishment is upon us now I can't say times nobody can say times but I'm telling you it's very soon it's very soon God is faithful was faithful in the promises they've been fulfilled and there's going to be big trouble soon don't think the Lord is delaying his coming do not think the Lord is delaying his coming and what about spiritual Israel well the promise was also to his descendants which is Christ and we read that in Galatians 3 verse 16 we read that let's just turn there briefly Galatians 3 verse 16 Galatians 3 verse 16 now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made who is his seed? Jesus Christ. He's his descendant to whom the promise were made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And so through Christ there's a blessing to all mankind. Look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 verse 11 and he received the sign of circumcision who? Abraham received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of faith the righteousness that he trusted and believed God and therefore he obeyed in faith which he had while Abraham was still uncircumcised yes indeed the faith of Abraham the original faith was before he was circumcised why? that he may be the father of all of those who believe though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also in other words to Gentiles and to Israelites Israelites yes circumcised Gentiles no not circumcised therefore the righteous is imputed to all brethren we are justified by faith because Christ died for us his sacrifice we need to understand brethren 
we need to understand and I think this sometimes would be an encouragement to some people that will say oh I've sinned so much I have had so many sins that God will never forgive me he'll never forgive me <coughs> I've come across a lot of people that said I have done so much God will never forgive me do you know what you're saying Christ's sacrifice is not good enough you know that he was of the form of God emptied himself from there of being eternal co-eternal with the father he emptied himself became a human being and he died and that was not good enough what you and I have no sin that cannot be forgiven you and I have no sin that cannot be forgiven unless you don't repent you see the child can keep knocking against the wall if he doesn't learn the lesson and, and says alright I better walk the right way if he says I'm going to keep knocking at the wall <coughs> that's it but he says no don't knock at the wall this, this, walk you in this way walk this way this is the way walk in it if he says no I don't want I want to keep doing that what are you doing you're blaspheming the power of the Holy Spirit because God's Holy Spirit is what's going to give you the help to help you overcome. We need to learn the lesson of hard knocks and change. And change. There's an important scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 10. By that will, in other words, Jesus Christ said, I've come to do your will, O God, says that in verse 9. Verse 9, so that will, it's Christ's will, desire, to come, to die for us, to die freely for us, freely, we have been sanctified, in other words, we have been justified, right, we have been cleansed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Our sins have been cleansed. We have been made perfect once for all. This is very big for us to grasp, but we need to grasp. One sacrifice of Christ, it's enough, is enough to cleanse us, to perfect us. That is it. You and I now are justified before God. All your sins are washed away. God, gone. You can now stand boldly in front of God through the, through the veil, which is Christ's body, and you can approach the Holy of Holies. Because Christ has cleansed you and I. Once for all. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, one offering, Christ's offering, once, he has perfected forever that one offering has cleansed us that's it that's it you don't need Christ to die a second time or a third time or every year it's once and there's no big sin that Christ can't forgive provided you repent He says, yes, perfected forever. Those who are being sanctified. In other words, you and I that are on the road to say, I'm now trying. And I'm now using God's Holy Spirit. Yeah, occasionally I trip. Occasionally I fall. But I stand up. I ask for forgiveness. And I keep going. 
but I am on the way there. Yes, I slip up. I'm walking in the light. That does not mean that we don't sin. I'm walking in the light. I'm not walking in darkness. I'm walking in the light. Yes, I trip. Yes, occasionally I sin. But I don't want to sin. I ask God again for, for His Spirit. Or yes, maybe I fell because of my weakness. But it was not willful. Yeah, maybe in your weakness you willingly fell. But that was not willful. There's a difference between willing and willful. Willful means I will not repent. I will hate God. I will not repent. I will not go that way. And that is it. That's willful. But provided you trip. And with the help of God's Holy Spirit you ask for forgiveness. And with the help of God's Holy Spirit you keep going. Remember you've been perfected your relationship with God is clean our advocate is defending us and he says okay George or put your name in there okay keep going and use the Holy Spirit don't quench the Spirit use the Spirit and overcome and overcome and look at verse 19 then. therefore brethren therefore having boldness you know take the kingdom of God by force having boldness not arrogant but boldness having trust that Christ's sacrifice is good enough for you and for me and for all of us and therefore have boldness to enter the holiest of all the holiest it was God's throne in heaven you and I enter it today <coughs> by the blood of Christ how? how? not in the old way that uh, high priest will do that only once a year on the day of atonement and only the high priest but now it's a new and living way that you and I do it a way which Christ consecrated it through the veil that was the veil between the holy and the holy of holies and that is through his flesh you and I can get through verse 22 let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith don't doubt and have your conscience have your conscience of whatever thing you've done in the past your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience if you are trying hard and you are trying and you know and you know that you're trying and you're not on the other side yes I fell down again but you know I'm going to work on it again I'm going to work on it again I'm going to work on it again Therefore do it. Keep doing. And by the way, verse 24, consider one another to stir up love and good works. So, you know, the ultimate goal is for us to be children of God in the kingdom of God. And that means to have love for other people. So consider one another in the spirit of love. And how do you do that? Not forsaking, verse 25, the assembling ourselves together. We have holy convocations. It's a holy convocation. That means it's a holy commandment to get together at Sabbath services and and uh, the holy days holy convocations yes if you can't you, you, you unwell etc yes God provides a way particularly today we've got other means but you are commanded not as the manner of some is unfortunately the manner of many is today so for because because, verse 26, because if you do that, you could be sinning willfully. If you are willfully not coming to church when you can, because it's a holy convocation, you could be committing the unpardonable sin. That's what it says in verse 26. Let's get back to the big picture. The importance of Genesis. God is creating a family of many children. He wants you and I to be in the kingdom to have love and outgoing kind of concern for others because that's the law of love. That's what He wants. He wants us to be able to have the power to make decisions and to be wise. 
And therefore, of that, it was necessary that we have free moral agency. And therefore, it was required that Christ would die and suffer. God, therefore, now is working through a physical family to bless the whole world physically. And we will do so in the world tomorrow. And God is working through a spiritual family, spiritual Israel, the body of Christ, the church of God, to bless the whole world spiritually and to be ultimately the whole world to be ultimately in the family of God and that will start as we'll see at Christ's second coming and God is doing all this through the family Abraham, Isaac and Jacob Israel his descendants that prove their trust their loyalty their faith in God you and I need to do the same brethren individually and to our families as we have ability we need to be a light and we need, you, you and I need to use God's Holy Spirit to go forwards which is a spirit of power of love and of a sound mind